J. Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. So let's start with three similar but very different statements. You seem quite normal. You seem quite average. You seem quite ordinary. From a very young age, we're measured and compared in one way or another to see if we're of normal or average size, whether it's when the percentile of our height or weight are calculated shortly after birth and throughout infancy, or in preschool and kindergarten when we're lining up for recess based on our height. Then there are the quizzes and tests, even the standardized tests, when we and our teachers and parents learn whether we're considered average, above average, or the worst fate of all, below average. Look up the word normal and you'll find definitions along the lines of usual, regular, common, typical, ordinary, or average. But is normal really the same thing as average, ordinary, or typical? So there we are talking with one another and after a few minutes I turn to you and I say, you know, you seem quite normal. If you were at the doctors and they told you that you seemed quite normal, maybe they even said everything is unremarkable, probably referring to tests or lab results, but still the words are normal or unremarkable. And you know, all things considered, you're probably glad to hear those words. It's a positive thing. Now, there we are again on another day and I say to you, you know, you seem quite average. Really? That's the best thing someone can say about you, that you seem quite average, as in commonplace, humdrum, run-of-the-mill, or unexceptional? Boy, normal or unremarkable sure sound better than being called average. And chances are, this time you probably don't take my words as being positive. Actually, you could be a bit offended. Most of us like to think of ourselves as being at least a little bit above average. So I appreciate your having taken offense at my calling you average. I get it. So I try to atone by saying that, you know, you seem quite ordinary. Hmm. Being called ordinary may just make being called average seem like a compliment. Ordinary, as if there's nothing special about you, nothing extraordinary to speak of. And yet most people strive to be normal, or at least considered normal. But when you think about it, should being normal be an aspirational goal? It seems that the word normal first entered the English language around the mid-1840s, soon followed by the words normality and normalcy. But when it was first used, it had nothing to do with people or their behavior. Instead, it was used in the context of mathematics derived from the Latin word norma, and it was referring to a carpenter's square or a T-square. Normal came to mean perpendicular or at right angles, but soon people began using the word normal in other contexts. For example, in the fields of anatomy and physiology when it was used to describe functioning organs and other systems inside the body. It was used in the context of a normal state. Interestingly, Normal state simply meant that which wasn't abnormal, but it wasn't otherwise defined. So let's say that you consider yourself to be relatively normal and maybe even somewhat more than average or ordinary. Do you think of yourself as being special, in a good way that is? As special as you may like to feel, the truth is that pretty much everything in your life has been designed not specifically because of your specialness, but for someone else. The truth is that pretty much everything you buy or use in your life was created not for you, but for someone else. And who would that be? Well, their name is the average person. The average person? The good and maybe the bad news is that the average person, all those things were designed for, is probably not you or me. That's because no one person is the average person. None of us is completely, statistically, average. Average. 
We've all used the word in a variety of contexts. There's a difference between being called an average student or being described as average looking and knowing what the average gallon of gas costs, and don't ask about that one. The concept, as the term applies to people and not numbers, was pioneered by a Belgian scientist, mathematician, and astronomer by the name of Adolphe Quetelet in the 1830s. You see, for many years, astronomers relied on the theory of averages, sometimes they called it the law of error, to gather accurate measurements of astronomical phenomena. They did so to compensate for their imprecise tools. For example, if they wanted to time the movement of a planet across the sky, they would etch small scratches in the glass of the telescope. And once the planet crossed that scratch mark, they'd begin counting and stop when the planet crossed a second scratch mark. Then they'd record the time it took to travel the distance. And if they were off by even a fraction of a second, their results would be faulty. And so they came to understand that if they averaged their times, the result would be a much better approximation of the true measurement. And then Quetelet realized that averaging could be applied to us humans. He believed it could be possible to identify the average physical and intellectual features of an entire population by gathering what he called the facts of life and then arriving at a snapshot of how an average man would normally behave by mapping those facts of life as bell-shaped curves. And there are those two words used together, normal and average. Quetelet soon came to be known as the champion of this new science, dedicated to tracking and recording people's physical and later their moral traits. That's right, their moral characteristics. He called it social mechanics, and he published a detailed account of the new science in 1835 entitled A Treatise on Man and the Development of His Faculties. Average and normal began to bisect one another in Quetelet's world. And in his words, Quetelet's average man was presented as an ideal type, almost as if the target or goal in nature was the creation of the average man. And any deviations from that target, well, they were errors or abnormalities. And then it happened. Quetelet concluded that not only is average a mathematically useful tool, but it was morally the right way to categorize and describe people. Quetelet proceeded to find averages anywhere he could. Critics argued, on the other hand, that an individual who truly reflected an average in every dimension and trait wasn't even biologically feasible. And his pioneering cross-sectional studies of human growth led him to conclude that other than the spurts of growth after birth and during puberty, our weight generally increases as the square of our height, and it became known as the Quetelet Index, until in 1972 it was actually termed the Body Max Index, or BMI, and that's something we still use today. And in fact, the Belgium government recognized Quetelet's contributions through the issuance of a postage stamp in his honor in 2017. So let's advance slightly into the 1860s, the time of the American Civil War. And it just so happened that President Abraham Lincoln was quite the fan of Quetelet and his science of averages. It seems that Lincoln was having difficulty managing the Union soldiers and he recognized that his officers didn't have an effective grasp of the soldiers' composition. For example, how well fed they were, or what kind of uniforms they needed. Lincoln realized the Union Army officers needed more information about their soldiers in order to better distribute their resources. So he ordered a significant study to assess the Union Army physically, medically, and mentally. And consistent with Quetelet's law of errors, averages were calculated and reported, and that information provided insight into everything from the distribution of food rations to the design of weapons to the soldiers' uniforms. One example was a better understanding of the trigger distance on muskets so that they could better reflect the average reach of a soldier. And another 
had to do with the uniforms the soldiers wore. Before the Civil War, uniforms were custom sewn. During the Civil War, though, a massive number of people had to be outfitted, and it just wasn't feasible for every uniform to be custom sewn. So instead, they needed to be mass produced, but they couldn't all be one size. So studies were undertaken and averages were arrived at. And based on the various average sizes, soldiers were put into three subtypes, large, medium, and small. Classifications that eventually found their way to civilian clothing that still continues today. Let's creep forward to 1926, when the U.S. Army was designing its first ever fighter plane cockpit. Engineers measured the physical dimensions of hundreds of male pilots and used that data to standardize cockpit dimensions for the average pilot. The size and shape of the seat, the distance to the pedals and the stick, the height of the windshield, even the shape of the flight helmets were all made to conform to the average 1920s male pilot. And that, in turn, effectively changed the way the pilots were selected. You see, the military would select men not so much on their skills, but on who would fit in the cockpit. And that cockpit, designed for the average pilot, well, it worked relatively well until World War II, when aviation played a key role in the war. The problem was there was a dearth of pilots. So the government began an intensive recruitment campaign for pilots, exponentially expanding its military aviation efforts and spending significant amounts of money on new planes. But the cockpits were still designed for the average 1920s male pilot, which actually resulted in a significant decline in performance and a substantial increase in the number of pilot deaths due to crashes. In fact, even after the war ended and pilots were training, there was a noticeable problem in their ability to control their planes. Interestingly, it became a part of the culture and folklore associated with the Air Force that it was simply dangerous to fly. No one knew what was really going on. They thought that maybe new pilots just weren't able to handle the new aviation technology. After all, those weren't simple propeller planes any longer. And even more intensive training programs didn't stem the tide of accidents and pilot deaths. So after blaming pilots, training programs, and new technology, it became apparent that the problem was those cockpit designs. They just didn't fit the average pilot any longer. The first instinct was to think that they've just been outgrown and the larger men from the 1940s were too big for the 1920 size cockpit. So in 1950, researchers at Wright Air Force Base in Ohio were tasked with finding a new average pilot size by taking 147 different dimensions of body size. And as the lead researcher traveled around the country from military base to military base measuring thousands of airmen, he realized there was an incredible variability from person to person, even within that limited demographic of young men. As he was measuring hands and legs and waists and foreheads, he kept asking himself how many pilots were actually average and found a problem with the concept of average pilot size. So he undertook a side study by taking the 10 dimensions of size that he felt mattered most, like height, shoulder size, chest circumference, sleeve length. And when he crunched the numbers of the 4,000 or so pilots he measured, not a single airman was even remotely close to average in all of the dimensions, none. So he concluded that if the military was designing something for the average pilot, it was literally designing to fit nobody. In that new era of jet-powered aviation where pilots were making split-second decisions that could be life or death, it mattered that pilots could reach what they needed to in the cockpit. Soon, Air Force engineers and contractors designed adjustable foot pedals, adjustable helmet straps, flight suits of various sizes, adjustable seats. And once all the adjustable elements and other design solutions were put into place, pilot performance soared. Today, 
We take for granted that equipment should fit a wide range of body sizes and not some standardized average person because in reality, no one is actually average. There is no average person. That being said, let's take a look at the average American. This one should be no surprise. Think about it. The average American believes they're actually smarter than the average American. That is, 55% of people polled said they thought they were smarter than the average American. Takes a little while to get your arms around that one. The average American produces almost six pounds of waste every day with about four and a half pounds per person going into the trash every day and only about a pound and a half being recycled. One in four Americans surveyed by National Public Radio, NPR, weren't paying much attention in science class. They thought and continue to think that the sun revolves around the earth and it doesn't. A survey commissioned by the U.S. Mint found that not only does the average American not know, actually most Americans didn't know, the names of the first four presidents in order. That would be George Washington, which most of you probably know, followed by John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison. The average American, in fact, more than 70% of Americans surveyed believes that Alexander Hamilton was one of our great presidents. He wasn't. Remember the unfortunate result of his duel with Aaron Burr? How many words do you know? The average adult English-speaking American knows more than 40,000 words, but we regularly use less than half of them. Here's a statistic. The average American can name all three stooges but not all three branches of the federal government. So that would be Larry, Curley, and Moe, and the executive, judicial, and legislative branches. The average American lives within three miles of a McDonald's and within 20 minutes of a Walmart. You know, we have this image that the average American is lacking in smarts, but the average IQ score has increased three points per decade since nationwide, nationwide IQ testing began in the 1920s. The average household size in the United States is 2.6 people, and families make up about 67% of those households. About 330 million people live in the United States. 60% of us live in the state in which we were born. The average American believes nature is sacred or spiritual, but the average American spends 95% of their time indoors. The average American spends over $100 more per year on shoes and sneakers than they do on vegetables, and they take showers that last about 10 minutes. The average American doesn't floss regularly. The average American man, about five foot nine inches tall and weighs about 199 pounds. The average American woman, five foot three, 170 pounds. Sad commentary. The average American aged 15 to 54 reads for only 10 minutes or less a day. Those between 20 and 34 had the lowest rates, averaging only about seven minutes of reading per day. That's leisurely reading. On the opposite end of the spectrum, those aged 75 and over read for an average of 51 minutes a day. And yet the average American watches 33 hours of TV a week and eats nearly 13 pounds of ice cream a year. The average American has $34 in their pocket and less than $1,000 in savings. In 2019, the average man first got married at age 30 and the average woman was 28 when she first wed. That's three years later for both men and women than it was in 2003, and four years later than it was in, two, in 1987, and seven years later than in 1968 when the average man first got married at age 23. The average length of a marriage in the United States is 8.2 years, which begs the question, what percentage of marriages end in divorce? 
The actual percentage that end in divorce varies between 40 and 50 percent, but it's actually significantly lower than it was in 2008 and 2009. And among adults age 50 and older, the national divorce rate has roughly doubled since 1990. And for those age 65 and older when they married, it's actually tripled, probably because by that age we're pretty well settled in our ways. Here's a brief look at how some averages have changed over the years. The average price of a new car in the United States at the end of 2021 was more than $47,000. In 1967, it was $3,215, and the average cost of a used car in 2021 was a whopping $28,000. The average sales price of a home has increased by more than 2,000% since 1963 to about $375,000 from $19,300. But in those days, the average wage was $4,500 a year, a gallon of gas, 30 cents, and you could buy a dozen eggs for 55 cents. If you've looked at the nutritional panel on the back of any packaged food product, you probably know that in addition to calories and grams of fat, carbohydrates, and protein, there's a line that says 2,000 calories a day is used for general nutritional advice. And if that sentence has led you to believe that the average American is actually eating 2,000 calories a day, you're off by a long shot. It seems the average American eats more like 3,600 calories a day, and that's about 25% more than they did in 1961. So why is the average American eating so much more than their parents and grandparents did? In large part, it seems to be the result of an explosion in portion size over the past few decades. The average size of many of our foods from fast food chains or sit-down restaurants or even in the grocery store has grown by as much as 138% in size since the 1970s. For example, since the 1970s when a standard bagel weighed 2 ounces, that number is now 4 ounces and about 300 calories. An average bottle of soda weighed 10.9 ounces, today it's 17.7 ounces. An average order of french fries at a fast food restaurant weighed 2.1 ounces, now it's 3.3 ounces. An average slice of pizza weighed 3 ounces, now it's about 6. And spaghetti and meatballs at a restaurant, the average serving size used to be 8 ounces, and now it's a pound, 16 ounces. The average blueberry muffin weighed 1.5 ounces. And now it's five ounces and generally more than 400 calories. And by the way, there's a difference between portion size and serving size. While a portion is the amount you decide to eat at any given meal, think how big a slice of cake that you take is. A serving is measured such as a slice of bread or eight ounces of milk. One study found that portion sizes at fast food restaurants increased by more than 200% between 1986 and 2016. The average American, well, 60% of Americans eat peanut butter at least once a week, and the average American eats three pounds of it a year. Smooth peanut butter preferred over chunky. So I have some questions for you. You can answer in the privacy of your home. Would you say you're normal if you've lied about your weight on your driver's license or to your doctor? Are you normal if you've lied about your weight to yourself? Is it normal to have laughed so hard that something came out of your nose or elsewhere? Do you think it's normal to believe in aliens or ghosts? Is it normal to talk to yourself? Do you think it's normal to have had an imaginary friend when you were a child? Well, how about as an adult? Is it normal to miss a fictional character after you've finished reading a book or watched a TV show or a movie? Do you think it's normal to wonder if you're crazy? Is it normal to wonder who will show up at your funeral? Is it normal if you can rub your belly and pat your head at the same time? Is it normal if you can't? Is it normal if your second toe is bigger 
than your big toe. Is it normal if you claim to be a healthy eater, but you have a candy bar or a bag of chips stashed somewhere, glove box, your purse, your drawer? Is it normal to have dropped something in the toilet and had to reach in to retrieve it? Studies say yes. Is it normal to have ever dated someone you were embarrassed to tell people about? Studies say yes. Have you ever pretended you didn't speak English or have spoken with a foreign accent when you're in public? Is it normal if someone's called your name and you pretended you didn't hear them? You know, the word normal suggests there's a right and a wrong way to be a person, but as we know, the truth is there isn't such a thing. The idea that there's some ideal standard we should conform to, it's unrealistic. It takes courage to stand out from the crowd and follow your own path. It may be easier to simply do what everyone else is doing, what they consider to be normal, but it probably won't be nearly as fulfilling. Then again, it can take a huge amount of energy to try and be normal. And by choosing normality or normalcy, you may just be giving up some of who you really are. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. Until then, remember, it's never too late to learn. And consider this, labels, like being normal, are useful for some things, like cans of soup, but they don't really work in a world of our own unique personality. People aren't easily categorized, and they shouldn't be. Why be normal? Why not just be you? And of all things, here's a quote spoken by the character Morticia Adams, written by Charles Adams, an American artist and cartoonist, best known for his darkly humorous Adams family, which actually began its life in the pages of the New Yorker magazine. And this is what Morticia Adams said. Normal is an illusion. What is normal for the spider is chaos for the fly. <laughs>